Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, we are on lesson number five on our uh, trip through God's mission, my mission, the last quarterly of this year. And we're excited. We're in November already for the first Sabbath. And I would like to welcome all the members of the panel, those that are here in the sanctuary and those that are watching us online. Um, I would like to let everyone introduce themselves. Make sure, you know, when you do that and when you have, you know, the rest of the comments, keep the microphones, you know, a little bit closer uh, to have um, enough power and for the online people to, to be able to hear what uh, God inspires us to say. So start on my right side. Steve Pereira. Tom Patzer. Sigil Danaydin. Fadia Cruiser. And Pastor Maglan. So before uh, we start our lesson study, let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to bless us. Uh, Pastor Tom, if you would like to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful Sabbath morning you've given us. And now as we open up your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, giving us uh, wisdom from on high so that we can have a, a meaningful and uh, thoughtful discussion here on this topic, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuses to avoid mission, that's the title of the lesson study, so let's dive uh, directly into it. Um, memory text, as far as the King James Version says, or the New King James Version, the one that you have in the lesson study, um, says this, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Do you see any connection between the memory text and what's happening in each one of these days, you know, of our lesson study? Yeah, I see you know, the connection there. What I see is this is the attitude that we're going to need to have. Other the opposite of what we see. In the, exactly. So uh, every topics. day it's telling us like uh, people are not quite, you know, going, you know, on this path straight away, you know, like from the very beginning. There are some detours. So those detours, we see them in our life. Um, go, go ahead. I was just Michael. thinking maybe we need some T-shirts and bumper stickers that says be like <laughs> Isaiah. <laughs> yeah. um, go ahead. Any more comments? You know, grab the microphone and go ahead. Well, it seems to me that um, the, this text in Isaiah is our, um, what should I say, our goal, our, uh, the theme that we should have for our life. But on the other hand, boy, how much we're like Jonah. Sometimes, you know, we don't see ourselves uh, like Abraham, you know, as the first paragraph starts, or any other people that say, uh, God, I'm ready. Put me where you want me. Tell me, you know, what's the to-do list for today? Not mine, but yours. So let's see how that uh, goes in. I was um, inspired, you know, by not only the way the Sabbath afternoon is constructed in those comments, but also the very last question. What can we learn from Jonah's attitude? Because we learn from the Bible that Jonah not only refused to go, he ran in the opposite direction. So he was using that time that he was supposed to um, have toward Nineveh going 180 degrees, you know, ahead of somewhere where God never intended him to be. So um, what can we learn from him? Uh, what is the, the <coughs> main um, impression that you've got, you know, reading, you know, these, these comments? What's the, the starting thought for this, uh, for this lesson study? At least um, Pastor Tom had a good idea how much we identify ourselves with, with Jonah and how much more we need Jesus when we see the similarities between our lives and him. Fadia, do you want to say a few things? Or anybody that grabs the, the microphone, that is a sign that I do not want to miss. So I'm giving them, you know, any option, you know, uh, possible. Maybe Pastor Milo, you know, wanted to say something, but... Uh, I will, I will pass. Um, I have a question after, you know, reading. Uh, so Abraham was the first one that was presented in opposition. Okay, Abraham never questioned God. He said, yes, God, he didn't even make any comment. Uh, where am I going to stay? You know, for how long? Uh, nothing of what we may think of today. And then Jonah comes. Is there any other Bible character that comes in your mind that was... Find, that was trying to find excuses 
not to go into that mission that God had for him. Any names? Uh, Steve? Oh, I, I'm just, I, a big obvious one is Moses. Amen. <clears throat> so um, what did he say? Uh, well, first he said he was slow of tongue and he didn't speak to the people and he, he had a, a plethora of excuses. He didn't know anyone, uh, Pastor Milam? I think of Peter, uh, you know, wanting to not want to go to the Gentiles. It, yes. God had to give him a dream and really work him over. Jeremiah. Have, Jeremiah. And we have, you know, Acts 10, you know. Poor Jeremiah. I feel bad for Jeremiah, the things he had to go through. Yeah. I mean, there, is, there is there is another um, Bible character, you know, that is Elijah. And Pastor Tom, you know, in the preliminary discussions that we had before the panel, uh, he mentioned Elijah. How discouraged he got, you know, after so many things that God worked through him, then he backed down. He said, what am I going to do? So um, we'll let, you know, Steve uh, display the Sunday section with one of the first excuses that our lesson study invites us to go over, which is fear. <clears throat> All right, let's see what I've got for Sunday. I just lost myself. All right, one of the reasons Jonah may have been unwilling to go to Nineveh was fear. The Assyrians were a formidable foe, and Nineveh served as the capital of the kingdom. The story was about Jonah, but it is for our admonition today. That's what we're instructed in the Bible, you know, is it 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13? Please, please tell me I'm right. <laughs> um, it, it, all that stuff happened to them. So we can see the story of Jonah, but we need to pl place ourselves, what's our excuse? Can you think of any reasons? So that was one of the questions I wrote down for myself. Can we think of any reasons why we're not? Um, and I'll mention some of the you guys mentioned some that you can think of. Some of the reasons keeping us from preaching the gospel and sharing it with other people. When you read about Nineveh and you see how wicked it was, uh, you know, self-preservation. Well, uh, we want to stay away completely from the cities, and, and that sounds like a great excuse. I want to stay away from the cities. I don't want to be polluted from them, kind of be like the Jews. We'll just keep to ourselves. Uh, you know, we're, we'll Comfort stay away. zone. You Comfort know, zone, right? Very easy. We'll keep a, a fear of getting in trouble at work. Um, you know, maybe we want to talk about it at work, right? Because we might get, might get fired, might get written up, might get yelled at, which, you know, the devil is just grooming us for Revelation 13, which would be the mark is your fear of getting, you know, of losing your job. Think about, uh, you know, that, and I think the final one is the one that gets the most of us is we think we're okay because we see how wicked Babylon is or Nineveh back then. Like, man, thank goodness we're not that. We're not in Babylon. So we don't, we forget about, well, you need to be preaching to them. We're just glad that we're not like them and we don't realize our, our real condition. So if anybody has any other ones they want to add to that, I'll kind of finish up. Any reasons why we're not? Pastor Tom? Well, so often uh, through the years that I was in the ministry, I, had, I would have people say to me, well, I, I just can't give Bible studies because I'd probably do more damage than good. <laughs> you know? Well, oh my. When are we going to learn? It's an interesting, you know, mindset. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a uh, what should I say? A false security mm -hmm. that these people have because when the Lord comes, He's going to say, "Well, why didn't you get out there and learn?" You know, He's going to He's not going to use the take the excuse. Well, I would have done more damage if I'd have gone out there, Lord. Uh, since you brought, you know, this uh, topic of self-preservation, I was thinking, you know, and also the dramatic things that uh, Steve mentioned, okay, from firing, you know, to get killed, you know, fear of those consequences. And I remember, you know, what Jesus said, you know, in his Gospels. He said, uh, whoever will try, you know, to save his life mm -hmm. will lose it. Yeah. And whoever will lose it for my name or for my sake Amen. will have it, you know, for eternity. And... In Sunday section, you know, this one that you have, um, we have the description of Nineveh as a magnificent city, but filled with ruthless people. I mean, you are admiring that city from a distance. You do not want, you know, to get closer. You know, like, say, okay, I will keep a safe distance. It's beautiful, you know, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, Pastor Milam? Uh, you know, this um, Sunday is about fear, but we're talking about physical fear. Yes. You got to understand who the Syrians were. And I think we got someone sitting with our special guest on our panel today that really can tell us how the Syrians work. I'm thankful that she is a Christian because knowing the history of the Syrians, they had a special thing that they would flay you. 
they would skin you and try to keep you alive as long as possible to torture you. I mean, the things that the Israelites knew about the Syrians, Jonah was in a true physical fear of, of, of his life. That's one, you know, there's going to be multiple reasons why Jonah didn't want to go. But on Sunday, we're talking about a physical fear. I mean, there was a fear of this warlike people. And if you travel around looking at different museums of Assyrian artifacts, there's nothing but bloodshed and war, and it, it's just awful. And uh, that's who they were. And it, it'd be like God asking you to go to ISIS today. Oh. And you see ISIS was beheading people, you know? And uh, if you look at some of we've I've seen them in uh, the British Museum where they have three severed heads that they're holding. Mm. You know, like, that's... Scary. Very scary. scary. And so we think of ISIS, you know, and we think these people are so demented, can they even change? Mm -hmm. Is it worth the time to put into them? They're, they're just so bloodthirsty. And imagine God saying, okay, go to them and rebuke them. Yeah, and rebuke them. Yeah, because yeah. that's what he did. He rebuked them. He walked the streets like, you're going to die for all that you're doing, you know. And go give them gifts. Yeah. At some point, you would think, you know, that the Inquisition, you know, kind of studied the history and borrowed, you know, some of their methods from these ruthless people, you know, that you just mentioned, you know, right now. It's very possible. Um, torturing, you know, people, it's, it's a very effective method to get what, you know, you wanted from them. Uh, Pastor Milan. You know, what I like to point out in this one is what I see, though, is talking about the physical fear, the physical fear that Jonah had. But God, in his patience and mercy, look what he did. I mean, the whole thing, he got thrown overboard. He let this fish swallow him, okay? Now, for three days. So when Jonah gets spit out of this fish, he just survived in the belly of a fish for three days, in the ocean, it probably helped him overcome that physical fear to uh, go face the Syrians. He just spent three days in the belly of the fish. Yeah, a lot like, of physical pain in there. Yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, God saw me through this. Okay, he's going to see me through walking down the streets in Nineveh preaching <laughs> to repent. You imagine you what he about, smelled like. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. All his senses were affected. Oh, wow. You know, in, in, in the belly of the whale, all his senses. Like, I can't stand thick, hot, smelly air, I feel like I can't breathe. And so whenever I think about this, I just think, what did he feel like in there? And hence why he says, if it was, I was in there forever, <laughs> you know. Um, so when I, and then I read Nam 1, uh, or 3, I'm sorry, and it, and it talks about that bloody city. And it's interesting, you look at the spiritual. I, I reflect back at when uh, the Satan showed um, um, Jesus the kingdom was of the, of the world, right, in Matthew 4, and he showed all the beauty of it, and um, that's the, the physical side that we see, when we see cities, but then there's the spiritual side, or, or, the, or the way that God sees things, right, you see the, this big, beautiful city, like Sodom, or all these cities, but this is how God sees it, he said in Nahum 3, woe to that city, it's full of lies and robbery, and pray, and pray departeth not, for the noise of the whip, and the noise of the rattling wheels, and of praying horses, and of jumping chariots. And then I skip to verse 4. It says, because of the multitudes of the whoredoms of thy um, <clears throat> well-favored harlot, the mistress of thy witchcrafts, that settleth nations through her whoredom and families through her witchcrafts. So in 1 Samuel, I think, uh, 12 or 15, um, Jesus compares um, stubbornness to idolatry to witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So it's just stubbornness to refuse to repent. can be. It's not just waving a wand and watching Harry Potter and all those things that we think of witchcraft. But it's also talking about stubbornness and refusing to repent and, and obey the gospel. And it just, verse 4 really made me think of, wow, the parallels with, um, really nice with um, Revelation 17, you know, the harlot, where it says there came seven angels with seven vials, and in the, the verse, skip to verse set, the 2, it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the habitations of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the wine of Babylon, we can tie that together, has made people stubborn that won't repent. They don't see that they're in Babylon. As soon as you start mentioning, stepping on toes with the health message or the Sabbath or Sunday sacredness or anything, then they're like immediately offended, walls go up, and that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, that's kind of what it made me think of. But it also is a nice rebuke to us because Revelation 3 talks about how we think that we're okay and we're increased with goods and we're in need of nothing. And Jesus gives us a rebuke 
uh, just like he did Jonah, and says, if you don't go, basically in uh, Revelation 3, he says, if you um, don't hold fast and repent, then I'll come in an hour when you don't know. Then verse 11, he says, I'll come quickly when you don't know, and I'll take your crown. So there's a further rebuke, even more. So come in an hour you don't know, and then you'll lose your salvation. Um, and, you, I know, and then he's talking to us in Laodicea, I know your works, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one, uh, so that because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Just like Jonah was spit out of the mouth of the whale. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of beautiful tie-ins there that you can tie in. And then the final verse 18, I counsel of you to buy gold tried in the fire, which shall be rich in, in white raiment and may be clothed in, which is Christ's righteousness. And the shame of your nakedness, which is your filthy rags, God will take off. And, you, and he'll put, give us eye salve. Um, so, you know, I thought that all, was all beautiful right there, that sim- similarities. And then um, message, uh, Mount of Blessings has a quote that says, The meek shall inherit the earth. It was through the desire for self-exaltation that sin entered the earth with our first parents lost dominion over that fair earth, their, um, their kingdom. It is through self abnegation that Christ redeems the lost. And he says that we are to overcome the same way. So it's that meekness. It's that humility. Whatever the reason, you just fill in the blank that Jonah didn't want to do, and it's not just one, usually. It's a whole plethora. We need to submit ourselves and be meek, and that's how we can get the eye salve and, and get that all that other stuff. Well, it leads me to Matthew 10, 28. This is something, again, with this Sunday was about physical fear. And the thing is, even us, we need to have, we need to have a fear. And, but it needs to be more of a reverence and a physical fear in that for God. But he says right here in Matthew 10, 28, it says, uh, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Amen. Our fear, we need to transfer. What can man do to us if God is with us? We need to make sure we have that, that reverent fear of God, the one that can spew us out of his mouth if we are not living according to the way he'd have us live. So it's important to... Uh, really make sure we we have our fear pop properly placed and unlike Jonah, and we're, there's a lot of fearful things in this world i mean really I, I if you told me i had to go face isis tomorrow go preach to them that doesn't sound like that that's there's a <laughs> man they're gonna get me yeah. yeah when i was studying this lesson what i have discovered um, it's like a main thought or a main idea out of that was jumping you know for me out of every lesson and that was doubt if you doubt God, that he is all-powerful, you will get afraid when he sends you to a dangerous place. If you doubt God, if you don't know how he thinks, if you don't know who he is, his character, then it will be so much easier to embrace a false view about him. If you doubt about who he is and what he can do, then it will be easy you know, to stay in your comfort zone and consider any, um, like, witnessing for him and about him an inconvenience you will be afraid of uncomfortable confrontation because you doubt that god can lead you through it and you will be less um, compelled to say here i am send me and i have um i found a quote in prophets and kings to support you know this um principle of doubt And this is found in pages 265 and 266. And it says this. As the prophet, talking about Jonah, thought of the difficulties and seeming impossibilities of this commission, he was tempted to question the wisdom of the call. He forgot for a moment that the God whom he served was was all-wise and all-powerful. And here it comes, the next sentence. While he hesitated, still doubting, Satan overwhelmed him with discouragement. And the rest of the story, we know it. So in those moments when we allow Satan, you know, to when we incline our ear to him, that's a bad moment for us and can steer us away from the real mission that God, you know, sent us to do. Pastor Milan. I mean, you know, Jesus says, I am. Mm-hmm. And there's where the doubt could. We doubt that he is, I am. But you know... If we don't doubt to believe that he is I am, it will inspire us to be like Isaiah and say, here I am, Amen. to serve I am. Um, I think we are ready to go to Monday where uh, Fadia, you know, has uh, the main feature. So just if you have the Bibles ready, you know, have uh, Jonah, the second chapter, you know, ready to uh, dive in. Um, Fadia? Okay. 
Um, I have one question, and that's in Second Kings chapter fourteen, verse twenty-five. That's Second Kings chapter fourteen, twenty-five, and I, I'm. This is a legitimate question I have, so if you guys could help me. Fourteen to twenty-five. Fourteen, verse twenty-five. Yes. It says, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath, Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittiah, the prophet, um, which was of gath Hepfer. Uh, for the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. So what is this talking about? Like, what, what was it that Jonah preached? Was he preaching to his people some kind of revival? Isn't it interesting? It's just like, was it's something totally must have been... perspective, yes. Yeah, like he must have had some stirring um, revival, and then God comes to him. I think, this is what I'm thinking, Amen. God comes to him and says, okay, you believe what you're preaching? Go Let's to Nineveh. See. That's the test. What do you guys think? I mean, I don't know. Am I? No, this would be chronological. That, that would be right. He, he did a stirring to his own Microphone, people. microphone. He's like, yeah, he's, his own people. He's like, gave this revival message, and it probably did a great work there. And he's like, okay, all right, I need you to take the same thing to Nineveh. Let's. Well, yeah. the Bible says, mind. you know, that God won't give us more than we can handle. So yeah. God provided, you know, enough strength for Jonah to fulfill this second mission to Nineveh. Yeah. But the personal choice is involved in everything. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that if Jonah did good, you know, in this uh, section that you brought to us, you know, 2 Kings 14, if he was able, you know, to complete or at least a phase of his journey with God, then what about the second phase? Let's grow. God gave him the opportunity to grow in faith. By doing this, you know, let's put you face to face, you know, with uh, your nemesis. Let's see what mm -hmm. can you do, you know, through me. And go ahead. Don't be afraid. Don't doubt to what I can do through you. Amen. At least that's, that's how I make, you know, this connection. Yeah. So, um... On Monday, it's about uh, world views or having a false view. And I don't know exactly, you know, how to relate to this, but one way I can relate to it is it's, it's a human worldview. It happened right in uh, the Garden of Eden. You know, right away when sin came in, what did Adam and Eve do? They hid. They ran away from God. They went the other way. And so I think this is just a human <laughs> worldview that we run away from what God calls us to do. You know, and, and I know we see Adam and Eve. It's just so ridiculous, but that's just our experience. You know, like God was always tender and loving and came and spent time with them. And then he comes and they're hiding. It's like, what changed, guys? You know, God didn't change. It, it was us, you know. This uh, chapter, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, no, no, no. Um, chapter 2, you know, that was uh, brought here, you know, for Monday section, brings an interesting, you know, testimony from Jonah while he was in a, a very uh, uncomfortable place, you know, um, in fish's belly. And that is uh, verse 7. And it tells us, you know, how low Jonah went and what brought him back up. And the Bible says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. So Jonah, even in those dire circumstances, he remembered the Lord. It's not like he forgotten, but he allowed, you know, the discouragement and everything that he did to cloud his judgment and to cloud, you know, this uh, perception of God that he was still there and he was waiting, you know, to give him, you know, a way out. Looking at this uh, chapter two, where we have Jonah, he's on this ship. This ship is being manned by pagan uh, sailors. What I got to see is look at this, you know, we're looking a little ahead that Jonah, another reason he did not want to go to Nineveh, because he absolutely hated them. 
They were the enemies of his people. He hated them. But you see a glimpse of the heart of Jonah here because here the storm's coming. Jonah knows why. He knows that God's angry with him. He knows why. And he's sleeping. He said, you know what? He had a heart for these, even these pagan guys here. He didn't know it. But he said, throw me overboard. Basically a suicide. Throw me overboard so you can be saved. You know, and that's another thing that we'll see that Jonah really struggled. So these pagans, whatever they were, he didn't have a hatred for them like he did the Syrians. But there was still God working on Jonah's heart to have the heart for those pagans. You know, he knew what was right. And reluctantly, Jonah, we find in his story, reluctantly, he did right. Uh, he was thinking of other safety in that. And that helped him in that ship. But that helped him later on with the Syrians. But he still had lots of problems there when he went to Nineveh. Uh, Fadia, if you want to continue, yep. please. So um, we see that Jonah's running the other way. But it's beautiful because God doesn't give up on him. Amen. Because he has a love for the Assyrians. Even though Jonah didn't. He had a love. And you think of, of the situation with um, Abraham and God. They're sitting there contending over um, Sodom and Gomorrah. And God's the one, like, I'm going to destroy it. And and Abraham's like, well, would you save it for this many people? They're going back and forth. And then this situation, God comes to Jonah, and he's like, don't you care about? I have people in there that I care about. You know, now this is God, like, please go. I need a human being to go there. I need someone in the flesh to go there because there's an enemy of souls, right? There's an enemy of souls. And he says, God, you do too much for these people. And if you come, you know, that for sure they're going to accept you. And so God's always like, I need a human being because I need permission to work in that city, right? And I need the prayers of, of the people of God. I need the physical body of the people of God. And you think about it. Jesus couldn't come as God. He had to come as a man to win man. And it's just like the correlations between Jonah and Jesus are incredible. This is the only prophet that he likens himself to. You guys remember where he says that? As uh, Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be. Both men um, had a mission to save the lost that were not worth saving. It, it, the Assyrians were not worth saving. They were the worst of the earth, and planet earth was the worst of God's creation. But God called both men. Both men were in a ship that was in a storm, and the storm was because of both men, right? And both men fell asleep in the storm, and they were awakened by those who were fearful. Wake up, pray to your God. Wake up, Jesus. Don't you care that we perish? Both um, had that situation. And you think, I mean, you could see parallels between Jesus and Jonah in this story that are just amazing. And yes. And Jonah had, while he was in the belly of the whale, he had um, weeds on his head. And Jesus had a crown of thorns. Um, when you see the parallel in this, you just realize, like, we are not worth saving. Planet Earth is not worth saving. But Jesus did the harder thing, just like Jonah did. And I'll tell you, this story is very near and dear to me, because as Pastor said, I am an Assyrian. 100% pure blood, come from northern Iraq. My family, my parents grew up there in northern Iraq. Um, they were forced out of their villages because of the Kurds coming in. Um, so I was born in Baghdad. I wasn't born up north. But I hear all about the north. And this is such a near and dear story to us to this day because we Assyrians know, we very well know where we would be without Jonah. This seat would be empty today if it weren't for Jonah. Isn't that amazing and amazing but and that's the thing is god didn't just look at the syrians in the city of nineveh he looked down through the ages and he says i have people 
descendant, mm-hmm. Claudia, that I want saved. I want a wife. I want her. She, he's using her in ministry with her husband. I mean, you see how God's plan is? The wheels mm-hmm. within wheels, just all the little things working every which way. Yeah. And it's because of Jonah that you're here today. Yeah. Wow. And we think that's just one man's experience. I'm just one person. What could I do? Wow. Right? But with right. God, we're told all things are possible. And one man's beautiful testimony, you have a whole culture of people that today, Jonah is a very popular name in our culture. It's either a first or a last name. Every year, there's three days of fasting in commemoration to Jonah. It's in January, February time. And it's either called the Fast of Jonah or the Fast of Nineveh. So we really know where we would be without Jonah. And guess what? We don't care how he felt. We love him anyway. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Because awesome. a lot of times we, all our fears are, what are they going to think of me? Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter because we know where we would be without you. So be mean. Be, you know, the most disgruntled evangelist on the planet, right? He hated the outcome of his evangelism. And we're like, we love you, Jonah. <laughs> And so you realize when you see Jesus then, he decided to do the harder thing because he had to face his life's, you know, eternity. You know, like, do I give up eternity for these people? And we don't realize, like, what what a grave decision he made, you know, the, the sins of the world upon. We just cannot imagine, and yet, He decided to do the harder thing, and we're all here today, and we all have the opportunity for eternity because one man decided to do the harder thing. And for eternity, we're going to be so happy, and we won't even think twice about Jesus struggling with that decision. We'll be like, we know that was a hard decision, and you beg the Father, if you can take this cup for me, nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. And ultimately... Jonah did God's will, even if he didn't want to and didn't feel like it. And God's like, I don't care about your feelings. Just do it. You know? So, um, yeah. Assyrians are all Christians today, just to give you a little background. Uh, We're all Christians today because eventually we were humbled. Right? So this was a great revival, but later on we know with Sennacherib, the 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 sin of Assyria was pride. And they just got prideful and started conquering again and doing what they did in the past. And that pride came up, and then God squashed them. And they became nothing. No country, no nothing. To this day, people don't know about us. You know, like they have no clue who we are, and that's biblical. Yeah, you have no country. No country. We're just people. We're just a culture. We speak Aramaic. That's the language that Jesus spoke. And we come from northern Iraq. And then in southern Iraq is the Chaldeans. And they speak Aramaic as well, and they're Christians. So we're the natives of northern and southern Iraq. But both people groups, people don't know about them, you know, because we were just so prideful. And now God puts us in the dust. And and now we're spread around the world because of the wars in, in Iraq, right? And um, because of the persecution of us being Christian, we're spread everywhere. And then people get to hear, like, I thought you people were gone. I thought you don't exist anymore. It's like, yeah, I know. I have to explain this all the time. I really do exist, you know? <laughs> and, and I have had people actually say, no, nah, I think you're wrong about your ethnicity. I'm like, okay. <laughs> God, God has humbled us. And any time the Assyrians start to think, ooh, we're something, boom, something happens again. We learn the hard way. And, um, but I thank God that he didn't give up on us. I mean, I just, it, it's, such, it's such a beautiful story because, oh, this is the other thing I was going to mention. You know, the lesson study mentioned that um, Sodom and Gomorrah, God said, that, that same verbiage, you know, where he says, your sins have come up before me. He, he pleads with Jonah. Their sins have come up before me. You need to go right now because their sins have come up before me. That's like judgment talk because 
Sodom and Gomorrah, God said their sins have come up, right? Uh, before the flood, their sins have come up before me, and then sudden destruction. Sodom and Gomorrah, the last one that I know of is Re Revelation 18. Their sins have come up before me, and then God will destroy. Why? Why did he spare these crazy Assyrians when the same verbiage was used in our condition? It's the story of grace Amen. in the Old Testament. You know, God, God gave us one story to see Jesus clearly in the Old Testament. And then it kind of leaves it in the end like, oh, what a downer. Like, so what happened with Jonah? What happened? It's our story, you know. We arrived to the end. Yes. The, that's right. That's right. You know, um, when you're talking about uh, the even if you don't want to do it, even if you're, you need to do it, um, it takes me to Jesus in Matthew 21, 28 through 31, uh, talking about the two sons. It says, what, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father, they said? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. This is, a, this is the story of Jonah. He didn't want to go, but he went ahead and went anyway. It took a little prodding through, you know, three days in a fish, but he still went. And this is what we need to remember is even if we don't feel like we don't want to... Start at go. Go and do the bidding of the Lord because there are souls hanging in the balance. There, and not only right there in that city of Nineveh, again, we have a testimony today right now, right here, this soul exists because Jonah did what he didn't want to do but did God's will. And like you said, Pastor Tom, uh, sometimes we have these excuses. Oh, but I don't know it good enough, and I'm going to mess it up. I'm gonna... There couldn't have been a worse testimony than Jonah's, and yet God still blessed through it. Now, if we are going to go ahead, you know, to the next chapter, you know, Jonah 3, and we see, you know, this brought up into the Tuesday section, um, like inconvenience, what do you think the inconvenience was? So, was it inconvenient because the people from Nineveh repented, or it was inconvenient because God could have been perceived as the one that didn't keep his word. Like he said, you know, this city will be destroyed, and he changed his mind. So in Jonah's mindset, he was almost um, appreciating or uplifting, you know, the justice of God, but forgetting his mercy. And if we need, you know, to understand, you know, the wholeness of God's character, we should, you know, see how story unfolds here. Um, since Fadia brought, you know, so many parallels bef <coughs> between Jonah and Jesus, <coughs> there is another parallel, you know, here with 40 days. So uh, verse 4 says, uh, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What can be done in 40 days? Where do you see in the Bible this length of time? Is it in the Old Testament or the New Testament? What is the 40 days? What is that length of time? Where can you, we find it again in the Bible? Moses went up on the mountain for Jesus fasting, you know, 40 days. So, Anna, yes, go ahead. In the Old Testament, the... Uh, Microphone, please. <laughs> in the Old Testament, when they were in the wilderness, because they... Uh, delayed 40 days. He gave him 40 years in the wilderness. So a lot can happen in literally 40 days or in 40 years. God can do miracles instantly because he can, because he is God. God didn't need 40 days to prove who Daniel was with his friends. He needed only 10 days. So God uses different lengths of time for a specific purpose. And to strengthen the similarity between Jonah and Jesus, he chose the same length of time, 40 days for the preaching and 40 days for the fasting and then the confrontation with Satan. And what happened here, um, if we were talking about worse testimonies, you know, as Fadia said, who can, you know, bring a worse testimony than Jonah? Um, if we will read... <clears throat> 
if we talk about Matthew 28, at uh, the end of the chapter, what thought comes into our mind? The Great Commission. Like something very encouraging. But we uh, have to remember that before um, verse 18, when Jesus said, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. There is a couple of verses that brings us a different light of these disciples. Verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus has appointed for them. And then verse 17, When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt it. Can God choose a, a minister for him? Can God choose a witness for him that is still doubting? Yes, we see that in Jonah and the consequences of all this doubt. Jesus chose, you know, the 12 disciples. We have a Thomas there, a symbol of doubt. We have from the beginning in, uh, in Eden when Satan was trying to instill doubt in Eve's ear. And he's trying to do that all the time. But Jesus, with his love and his self-sacrifice, is overthrowing all these, <clears throat> all these excuses, fear, false views, inconvenience, and whatever may come. Just if we will look at him, at his life, and what he did for us. Pastor Milo. So that's why, like you said, can God use people that are doubting or have issues like that absolutely because that's god's how god his, in his plan of salvation in using humans that's how he works he likes the two for one deal he's going to go send you to people that need to be saved but in the process he's working on you so you can be saved as well sometimes i feel like that's why i got called to ministry to save me to help me that now my job i have to be in the word of god i you know and that helps me in that you know because i am prone to wander prone to run. So he's trying to help me as well. God's always looking for the two-for-one deals. He's, he's wearing that person that he uses to help them on their, their salvation as well as the people they're to reach. There is one more thought that I have discovered in Tuesday's section that I would like to, to bring, you know, um, to discussion, and is the connection between faith and works. Exactly what Paul, you know, emphasizing. Both are necessary. What did people from Nineveh do? Verse 5 tells us. After they heard, you know, Jonah's testimony. So the people of Nineveh believe, and it says not Jonah, but they believe God. Mm -hmm. They saw God in that message. And what did they do? They did some things in between verse 5 and 10. And verse 10 tells us, then God saw, not necessarily their trust or their belief, but saw the result of their belief. And it says, God saw their works that they turn from the evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. The relationship between true faith and the works that follow prompted, fueled by that faith. Pastor Milo. I, I, you brought up a point there in verse 5. It says, and the people believed God. That tells you that the Holy Spirit was in full effect there. It was Jonah. They were looking past Jonah. It was the words. It was the Holy Spirit working. And that's another thing that we need to remember today. It's not us. It's not us. So why should we fear what they're going to say to us? What it's God that's going to be speaking to them. It's a rejection of him if they reject, not you. You know, we, we have an inconvenient truth. <laughs> that's really what it is, too. And, and, and I know that's what keeps a lot of people because of people's reactions to our inconvenient truth. But um, Jesus... You know, when, when he was walking on the earth, it says, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, you would see a sign from thee. They wanted, like, can you make it really clear? You know, and he... You um, be given a sign, except... Yeah, and, and, you know, as they say here, bless his heart. <laughs> he put up with it. Um, and then it says right after that, in verse uh, 39, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation 
and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Amen. And that it's like it's amazing. Yeah. What clear, you know, <laughs> statements do you want, you know, than that? Um, since you brought, you know, this idea of an inconvenient truth, you know, preaching that can lead us into very uncomfortable confrontations. And Pastor Tom will uh, tell us more about that. Back in 1966, my father bought an airstrip just uh, about 100 miles from here, um, and we moved from North Dakota to Arkansas. Now, it, it, remember, in 60s was the height of confrontation between blacks and whites. I mean, it was right then that uh, right here in Little Rock, they had uh, all kinds of problems going on and um, in the little town where we were at the black school mysteriously burned down and so the, all the black students had to be sent to our white school <clears throat> well you can about imagine how that went over <clears throat> there was all kinds of hatred um, name calling um, I can remember the football coach telling the team, the white team, he says, I do not want a colored player on this team. I want an all-white team. You guys do what you have to. And they did. And it was an all-white team for a while. So, you know, I think all of us have gone through times of hatred. Uh, we, we've seen it. We maybe even felt it ourselves. And so for... For uh, Jonah, being told to go to a people that hated him and his people, uh, I can kind of picture what was going on in his mind there. Really, Lord? Isn't there something else that I can do besides this? <laughs> I mean, wow, this has got to be over the top for anybody. You talk about inconvenience. I don't. I, I just don't want to do this, and um, but you know, when the Lord told him to go, he had to go, and you would think spending three days in the belly of a fish would uh, help him to uh, clear some thing thought processes in his mind, but uh, he was still mad at God and. One of the things he was mad at is, is the fact that God just would not destroy Nineveh. You know, what is it, God? Come on. You, you destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for basically the same thing. Um, what's up here? Why can't you just hurry up and do it? I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to watch. And uh, you, better, you better take some action here real quick because it's hot out here. And so he's sitting there, and all of a sudden, this plant starts to grow and mysteriously provides shade. And uh, that alone should have sparked his thought processes, but um, he didn't. And, and I don't know if he did it say that he fell asleep or whatever, and the plant died. Um, he w wakes up probably all sunburned. And uh, still, Nineveh's still sitting there. What's up, God? You know, and um, so God confronts him. Now, isn't this neat? He confronts him. Does he confront us too? Yes. Yeah. Now, not with a sermon, not, uh, not by scolding him, not by saying, boy, did I make a mistake calling you out here. I should have gotten somebody else that wasn't such a hardhead. You know, um, no, he, he, he creates an experience. And um, as a, we talked about this plant, and then after the plant dies and, and he's really angry, um, take my life. Wow. What, what a death wish, huh? Take my life. Really? You know, had he taken his life right then, you almost got to wonder, 
would there have been salvation for him because of his attitude and, and uh, resistance? But um, God is gentle and comes back with, you know, why, why are you so angry? Oh, he says, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Boy, he was, you know, just spitting venom. And, um, you know, it's just like when God confronted Adam and Eve. He says, uh, who told you you were naked? And here he's saying to Jonah, is it, is it worse that the plant died or that I would have ki- killed all these people? Um, he had, he, you know, he had no idea really, how precious in the sight of God these people were. And yet, yet he did say, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen because you're slow to anger. You're merciful. You're, you're you know, abundant mercy and, and, and gracious. And you relent to do any harm. You know, this story, like somebody said, this is, this is our story. And this is our message, that the God is merciful, and he's gracious, he's long-suffering, he's abundant in mercy. And this, this should be what we share with others, too. Amen. In that, you know, um, but I see, you know, there's a question on Wednesday. It says, what is wrong with this man? Yes. Yeah. And for us, <laughs> yeah, what is wrong with this man? Yeah, all of us, but yeah. What is wrong with him, and this is where God's great mercy, even because he knows what's wrong with us, satanic themes and traits, the um, traps of the devil. Jonah had them, both, the most powerful ones, pride and prejudice. He had a pride. He did not want to be known as a false prophet. He didn't want to go in there and not God destroy, and then, oh, look at this guy. He came and said all that, nothing happened. Uh, Jonah's, Jonah's a liar. Jonah's a false prophet. His pride was overwhelming. But then also that other trap. And that's, it's big today, and the devil's going to work in it. We're told in the last days there's going to be so much prejudice between people groups or whatever that it's going to be overwhelming. He had a prejudice for these Assyrians. Now, you could say rightfully so because the way they treated his people, but as a Christian, it's not rightfully so. It doesn't matter what they've done to you, what they've done to you in the past, what they've done to your people. God loves them. They are still a people. They are human, and we need to be... Uh, falling in God's way and reach out to everyone no matter what they've done or done to us or our family. And the thing is, is there's no culture on planet Earth that can say, I, my culture has never hurt anybody. Right. Somebody's hurt somebody somewhere in, in history, right? Yeah. And so today, Assyrians are persecuted uh, by the Kurds, by the Turks, and by the Arabs. Okay, and... Um, the Kurds in particular, because they've come and taken over our Christian territory up north and pushed us out. And my grand- grandmother actually died because they were pushed out of their village. She was eight months pregnant, had to flee, and lost her life because, you know, uh, got, got pregnancy-induced hypertension while they're fleeing. And, uh, and they've just done a lot of things to us and continue to do it to this day. And so I can be prejudiced towards the Kurds, right? Because my family has personally been affected by them. But by God's grace, I am a Christian first. And so I have had the opportunity to witness to Kurds and share the gospel with them. I don't have to have warm fuzzies for them to share the gospel with them. I don't have to have this great love for them. I just have to share the gospel with them. You know, regardless of what they've done for me, I share the gospel with them, and um, I don't take it personally what their culture has done to my culture, because in the back of my mind, I know what my culture has done to others, you know, and, and, and also we all know that when it comes down to it, we're all sinners and in need of a Savior, and so that's ultimately what we need to convey to others, even if they've hurt us personally. I think these words that Elijah said in verse in chapter 4, um, I know you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. 
one who relents from doing harm. If he would have said those things, fully convinced that's the truth and not hating that that's the reality, maybe, you know, the balance would have tipped, you know, in his favor a little bit earlier. But these words, you know, put in the right context tells us that we have to be, you know, happy that God is how he is. Pastor Mike. That was a great controversy battle waging in Jonah's heart. He knew. He knew, right, I know you're this, but I want this. Mm -hmm. That was, you see the great controversy waging in the heart of that man right there. You know, applying this to our situation, as you mentioned earlier, um, as we come down to the end of time, because of our message, we will be hated beyond anything we've ever experienced in the past. And so we still have the message, though. Mm -hmm. Take Christ to these people, despite how much they hate you. And uh, that's going to be tough, except that we can recall what Jonah went through, and, and we'll do it there. Exactly. And I think that's what, uh, you know, Pastor Milam will, will end, you know, this with this decision. Here am I. Send me. Go with the message, if you Amen. would like to Amen. elaborate. A sure, bit. sure. The, um, the last thing on that I want to say is, that, you know, uh, uh, Spirit of Prophecy, we're told that one of the worst things we can do is, as we move forward in the future, is to forget how God has led us in the past. And so that's, God has led, the story of Jonah right here is perfect for us to see how God has led, how God expects what he expects of us as we move forward in reaching people for him. Again, God is love, loves everyone. So we have a job to do. And again, we said, be like Isaiah, right? What was Isaiah's words? He said, here I am, send me. And that's exactly where we need to be. Now, that's not the easiest thing where, you know, that part of us is like, yeah, here I am, send me. I love you, God, what you did for me. But the other part is like, I don't want to go. For all these various reasons, fear, inconvenience, uh, pride, prejudice, whatever it may be, that's holding us back. And that's why we continue. It's so important to grow in Christ's righteousness, allowing him to indwell in us because he can transform us to be that person, to be able to go out there and say, here, I am, send me. When you allow the I am to indwell in you, you will be able to say, here, I am, send me. Because it's actually him and you that's going to be doing that. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing that we need to be. It says, God seeks only willing and humble messengers who will follow his direction. Amen. That is our job, to be willing and humble. That's it. Everything else he will do. And moving forward, that is what we need to do. But in that, we need to remember that we are not worthy. We need to remember what God has done for us. And when we can do that, we will not look at these people, oh, they're not worthy of you. They're not worthy of God. We'll say, oh, if God can save me, he can anybody, wherever they are. Amen. You just made me think, you know, um, God's calling us to the other uttermost parts of the earth, you know, places that haven't even heard the name Jesus. And we're comfortable here in the U.S. You know, we got it good. And um, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to leave the comforts, you know. Um, but God wants us to be faithful where we're at. And right now, God has given us the privilege at, in this church to have a meeting, right? He's given us the ability, the place, the funds, all of that. And are we willing to say, here I am, send me? But when you see people sitting in the sanctuary, Lord, here I am, send me to sit by somebody, Right? Here I am. That person is uncomfortable. They have come into your space. So if you're nervous, they're 10 times more nervous than you. You know, they, they have come out of their comfort zone. And so if you could just take a few chairs over and sit next to them, talk with them, and, and overcome your fears, right? Who cares what you feel like? Because you talking to them lowers their fears. Right, because then they don't feel like an awkward, weird person, right? Outsider. They feel welcomed by you, and you just dissolve their fears. Uh, I know one, one uh, place in Arkansas, we did meetings, and we told the church, you know, go around. And this, he was the shyest man in the church, and he went out of his way. After he heard that, he's like, I'm going to talk to people. And so he went and talked to this couple. That couple was not going to come back 
This is years ago because Chad looked a lot younger then. And they're like, who is this kid? What is he going to teach me? And so they were not going to come back except that church member talked to them, made them feel comfortable, and they recognized them because the grandma had fallen and, and broken her hip, and she was in the nursing home that the lady worked at, and she remembered this family and how special they were, and they came back again. If they hadn't made that connection, they would have never come back. These two came into the church and then became missionaries overseas. I mean, how does, I mean, if we step out of our comfort zone, who cares what we go through? Jonah went through hell, right? It, that's what the yeah. text says. He went through right. hell. Yes. Going to another seat today, that's like hell for us because we're such <laughs> introverts, right? right. We, we've destroyed our, our bodies to a point where we're scared to do anything. And so God's like, just step out of your comfort zone. I'll take it over once you do it. Satan has made it that way, that we're afraid of being close to people. He's closed us off. He wants us disconnected. Uh, as we close here, you know, this, I just want to say two things. It's a, here from the lesson today. It's a call is there. God is looking for willing volunteers. We are to answer that call by submitting to his leadership, listening to hear his voice, and then choosing to obey whatever he tells us. Amen. If we will follow this formula, it will be a success for you and access for many people walking through those pearly gates one day. Amen. Now, the, there's a challenge that Thursday Lesson gave us, and I think it's a great challenge. I'm going to do it myself, and it's very simple. Uh, write down 10 people that you want to see in the kingdom. 10 people. Write them down. And when you do, make it a point that you are going to pray every day for these 10 people. Very simple challenge God's asking us to do. Very simple. 10 people. Start with 10. You may end up with more than that, but start with 10, pray for them every day and see what God does. He's going to open up opportunities for you. They go 10. You see how the kingdom would be filled that way? It's kind of like a pyramid scheme, but it's not illegal. <laughs> All right. This was a great lesson. Thank yes. you, Fadi, for joining us. Yes. And especially your, your special insight being an Assyrian, I think. And that's what God. <laughs> what a, yes. This is how God works. Even yes. in the little things, this lesson happens on the week she's here, the one that she was able to study because they're busy. And God knew that she was going to be here and give us a special insight from that culture to give us a deeper understanding. Yes. That, I, would, I have to be not knowing yes, yeah. what's going to happen. Wow. Well, and remember, you never know the results of going out to people throughout the ages. Many Assyrians in Nineveh were saved. But I tell you, she told us, Fadia would not be here with us today if Jonah would not have went and preached to Nineveh. Amen. The Assyrians would have been wiped out. This Assyrian would not be here with us today. Amen. But praise the Lord, Jonah went to Nineveh even though he didn't want to. And God has worked wonderfully through it. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming today, being members of the panel, those from the audience and those that watched us online. Um, after a short break, we will continue the worship service. Um, I would like, you know, since Fadia was uh, in the center, please lead us into the closing prayer of this lesson. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you for the blessings you give us in your word, Lord, that we can look to people like Jonah and be encouraged, not be discouraged, Lord, but be encouraged that you will be with us even through our shortcomings, you will be with us. Even through our mistakes, you will be with us and you will have a harvest uh, through us even with our mistakes and everything. You have promised that you will work if we are willing. And eventually he was willing even though uh, it didn't feel good. And so Lord, we praise you and we pray that you'd help us to do the same to show your love to the world regardless of how we feel. And we thank you ultimately for Jesus who showed us that, that even though he was struggling, he still went forward. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Check. Check. It's okay.
Y... Testing, testing. Testing. What's that? All right, God is good to us, amen? Happy Sabbath. We're good to see you all here today. We've got a little feedback going on here. Maybe I should be back here. Maybe that'll help behind these microphones. See if I can do this backwards without falling down. I could have did it easily 20 years ago, but it's a little bit of a challenge now. It is good to see everybody this morning. Nice, crisp, fall Sabbath day. We have a few announcements for you today. Uh, I want you to look into your bulletins and see what we have here. Now, many of you know we have evangelism seminar going on right now. It started Tuesday night. It's wonderful meetings. We have some wonderful new friends that are here with us each night. I encourage you to come out and be with us each night. And if you can't, at least watch online. But don't let having online be an excuse not to come physically and be with us. We'd love to see your face. We'd love you to be with us. Amen? Now, as Adventists, this is, we say, oh, that's just for the new people to learn. No, 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 no. We are coming in time. We're going to have to fully understand what we believe and stand on it. We're going to have to have faith like no other. Amen? The more we hear it, the more we hear the truth, the more we are sanctified, the more we are drawn to it, the more we can stand in it and share it with others. So please, come out, be with your church family each night. We've had, we've been well attended each night, and we just want to see every one of you that can be here with us. So again, tonight, it will be at 7 o'clock, Revelation Revealed, with our evangelist, Chad Cruiser, and he's actually going to be our speaker today. This will not be one of the evangelism topics during the uh, service today, but he will be sharing the message with us today. Also, if you know any young people, we have a Truth for Youth service going down the hall. We have our young people that are presenting the same truths to people their age as well. It's a wonderful time. Invite your friends and family and young people out. Amen? All right. So the next thing I have is I have uh, Pastor Tom, or Elder Tom, uh, come up. He's got something, something for you. Oh, good morning. Pastor is is re- very correct when he talked about the good meetings we're having here each night, and I know that you've been praying for them because um, you can see it. You can just see it in the eyes of the people who are attending, and it's been a tremendous blessing. And I just want to give a quick reminder of our little something I plugged last week, our chat box out there in the foyer. Um, we're giving you an opportunity to ask any questions, uh, con- uh, share any concerns, maybe talk about um, speakers that you've heard someplace else that maybe you'd like to hear in our church, uh, topics you'd like to hear in sermons, whatever whatever's on your heart, share it with us, and we'd be glad to glad to answer. We're hoping to have an elders' minute at the end of each. Uh, a uh, series of uh, announcements each Sabbath and answer questions, things like that. So, uh, also testimonies. We love to have testimonies. We want to make this as positive as we can. And next week, we've got a, we're going to have a testimony that you're going to love. So, don't miss next week. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, this side was a little louder than this side. One more time. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Amen. So uh, how many here is loving this fall weather? Amen. I, I love it. And uh, it's a reminder that the fourth Thursday of this month is what? Thanksgiving. That's right. Well, the uh, community center here every year, I guess from what I've been told, does Thanksgiving baskets, and we're doing it again. And so if you know of anybody uh, that may need some extra food, needs a box, please uh, reach out to Ofa or myself or Pat or Carol. They, uh, they're not out of it yet. <laughs> uh, so I want to get these boxes into people's hands and homes that can need it. And if there's anything else besides the Thanksgiving boxes that you know of, please let us know because that's what we're here for. We're here to reach out to our community and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen? All right. And you can just, uh, we'll put the phone number in there next week, but if you'll please just, if you have a name, get hold of us after church and we'll give you information on that, okay? Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are uh, probably, you know, one microphone short, but we know how to share. So uh, we won't be able to have the words on the screen today. If you want to grab a hymnal, they should be, you know, plenty around. We will uh, start with uh, hymn number 560, and uh, I would like to uh, express my thankfulness toward uh, Rosemary. She is back with us, you know, at the piano and uh, all the members of the team today. So 560, we are in the Thanksgiving season. Let all things now live. the heads were down, you know, watching in the words of the hymnal. Um, the next one will be Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Thank you. 
last three verses, we'll sing them all. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, march beneath thy tenderest care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folks prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought Burdens are lifted at Calvary.
as you're able for the doxology, 695, with the Amen. remain standing for the opening song, Be Thou My Vision, but prayer first. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us. We pray that Jesus would be uplifted, for in his name we pray, amen. If you have the hymnals ready, look for 547, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you. Now it's time for worship in giving. What's the first word comes to mind you think of when we say worship in giving? Money, money. It's the first word that comes to mind, but I want to tell you that money is not what it's all about. The word that needs to come to mind is faith. Faith. That's what worship and giving is all about, is faith. In 1 John 5, 4, we're told that faith is the victory. 
In Romans 1.17, it says, The just shall live by faith. Now I want to read a promise to you from God in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, said the Lord of hosts. The one time in the Bible, God says, test me. He says, has faith in me, have faith in my promise. If you will be faithful in your giving, I will take care of you. Not only take care of you, I will open up the windows of heaven and the blessings you cannot even comprehend or receive. And this will come in a multitude of ways. It won't come in just finances. It will come in good health. It will come, he says, rebuke the devourer. There will be things that you have that won't wear out. God wants us to be faithful in our tithes and offerings, not for him. He owns everything, amen? He doesn't need the money, but we need to give it to grow our faith. Brothers and sisters, the time is coming when we're going to have to have rock-solid faith. And God knows that, and he knows one of the simplest things to do that is through money. Because we all need money, we all trust in money, and he wants us to do that. Luke 16, 10, he says, He who is faithful in little is faithful in much. To God, money is little. To us, it's a lot. But he wants us to look at it as he looks at it. Money's little. He'll take care of it for us. Amen? God owns it all. I tell you what, faith is built by our being faithful in giving tithes and offerings. God can do more with 80 or 85% of what you bring in than what you can do with 100%. I guarantee it. I've lived it. I've seen it. I know it. We cannot afford to not be faithful. Now, I may have shared this before, but it's been so profound in my life. It was an event that solidified it for me that there is a God in heaven and he's real and he answers our prayers. Now, this is a story about when I was going through school to receive my theology degree. We didn't have a lot of money. Before that, we had all the money we ever wanted. But God, a fool and his money are soon parted. But that's a whole different story. But we had to rely fully on God. My wife had a $10 an hour job. We had myself in college, my kids in advanced education. When we looked, put our bills on paper, we were $800 short each month on paper. But we propose, Lord, we will be faithful to you first. We will give our tithes and offerings first before anything else. And I tell you, throughout those four years, we never had a deficit. We always had a little bit more left in the bank account. But here's where the story that I want to share with you to inspire and encourage you. One time, we had a bill that we needed to be paid, and we didn't have the money for it. And we had decided that we would never ask anybody for money during that time. We would take it to the Lord in prayer. And for this bill, we took it to the Lord in prayer. Now, when that bill was due, I went and opened up the mailbox, opened up a letter from my sister. In the mailbox from my sister was a check for 400 and some odd dollars and 10 cents. I remember it was $400. I don't remember it, but I remember the 10 cents. A check for the exact amount of what that bill was, down to the very dime. Again, we never spoke to anybody about this, but her and I in prayer to God. So I'm like, how did my sister know? I had to call my sister. I called her. And she says, no, brother, I woke up last week, and I was inspired to send you that amount of money. I wrote a check. I sent it to you. There is a God in heaven. He's real. Amen? We can't afford not to be faithful. God will take care of you. Take care of him. Use your money to grow your faith in him. And uh, watch the amazing things that he will do. Today, our offering is for the local budget. I'm telling you today, in faith, test him today. Our new budget, we have actually, the finance team got together. We tightened our belts, looked where we could make changes. We went from 12 7 to 11 250 But that doesn't mean give less. Give more. Because the more we have, the more we have in this local church, the more we can do for the kingdom. Amen? All right. May our uh, deacons please stand as we pray.
and uh, we give everybody a chance to be as faithful as we want to be and grow in our faith. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for another wonderful day of life. I'm thankful for this Sabbath day. I'm thankful for each and every person in this room. Lord, what a blessing for us to be together here in your presence. Lord, we pray that you will bless these offerings as they're given, these tithes and offerings. Let them go far and wide to spread your word, the truth of your love, Lord, that Jesus is coming again for his people. Lord, thank you for all you've done. May your blessings be upon us as you promised. We're in faith in your word that you will show us the way forward and we will be stronger in our faith because of this uh, thing that you have given us through tithes and offerings. Thank you for what you're going to do for us through this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, boys and girls, it's story time. Miss Reagan's going to have the story understand. And so we want the little ones to go around and gather up all the funds for our school. We had week of prayer this week in the school and had a lot of fun working with the kids there. So do your, do your thing, kids.
Well, the Pathfinder's being out. Whoa. Good morning. I'm just going to hold it way out here. All right, good morning. And thank you, everyone, you know, for your donations to our, you know, your support of the school. It means a lot, you know, that these kids can, can come to our school and do things. Turn me down. Turn me down. <laughs> you know, this week at school, we were teaching the kids how to sew. That's a good skill, right? Our kids are sewing. It's amazing. All right. Who can tell me what this is? What is this? Is it like a ruler? Like, kind of like a ruler. A level. It's a level. What can I do with a level? Measure stuff. Measure stuff? Should we? Stick it to stuff. It is magnet. We can stick it to stuff. <laughs> Sebastian, what do you see in the middle of that? A what? A bubble. Absolutely. There's a bubble in there. And if I put it straight on the ground, I can see if my ground is level. If in the center there's a bubble right in the middle, that means it's level. Yeah? Have you guys ever used a level before? No. No? Well, I might use a level to help my mommy or daddy hang a picture. They might put a picture on the wall. Now, if it's like this, do you see where my bubble went? Is it in the middle? No. It's, what about this way? No. What if I'm building a cabinet? And I put my level on here, and it's a kitchen cabinet. And I make it like this. And then I put some eggs on my cabinet. What might happen to those eggs? They're going to slide right off and make a big old mess, right? Well, we're going to talk about being balanced. Who's been balanced before? If I, have you been balanced before? <laughs> Yep, that's a balance, all right. Now, this level is a really good reminder of having balance in our lives. If I put this on my head, do you think I have balance? Oh, probably not. I've got a big flat head. I wonder if on top of my bubble's in the middle. Do you think my bubble's in the middle? I don't think I have much. I don't have good balance today. Well... There's a book in the Bible, and it's called Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, there's a very wise man, and his name was... Who knows a wise man in the Bible? It was Solomon. That's what you guys were going to say, wasn't it? It was Solomon. Solomon. Yep. And he said that there's a time and a season for everything. And right now, your lives are pretty simple. You might have time to play. Time to spend with Jesus, time to do a little bit of schoolwork, time to be with your family, and of course, you have time to go to sleep. Yeah, I love all that. Now, as you grow older, you're going to have more things that take up your time. Sports, music, school clubs, volunteer work, jobs, and of course, more homework. And it's going to get more and more challenging to make time for all the things that you want to do and the things you have to do. So how do we keep balanced? Do we just wear better shoes and just, no? <laughs> well, we know that the level's balanced when the bubble is in where? Where does the bubble have to be? Can you tell me where the bubble has to be to be level? In the middle. Yeah. In the middle, yep. So we can keep our lives balanced when we keep God in the center of our lives. And when you put God first, he gives you wisdom to know how to keep balance. You learn how to make time for the stuff that you have to do, like homework and practices and jobs and the stuff you want to do, like playing and having fun, and the stuff you need to do, like spending time with your family and God. And when God falls away from the center, what happens? We can get out of balance very quickly. But if we keep God in the center of our lives, we're going to find that we have more than enough time to do all the things and the important things in our lives. Azariah, do you want to pray for Mommy today? Do you want to pray? Okay. Thank you, God, for everything you made. Amen. All right, you guys come back out of your seats.
right, it's time for scripture and prayer, and I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I'll give you just a couple seconds. Look it up. Oh, <laughs> they put it on the board. That's nice. All right, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, In be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. At this time, we're going to have the garden of prayer. I'll come down to the front here, and if there's anyone who would like to join for the morning prayer, you're welcome to come down, or if you have any prayer requests that you would like to uh, put in my Bible at that time, feel free to come and do that also. We're going to sing a little song before we have our prayer. Let us all kneel as we pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege, what a privilege it is to come into your sanctuary today and kneel before your throne, to be able to talk to you as brother talks to brother, to be able to have your presence dwell with us as we worship. And Lord, we lift up to you prayer requests today. We think of Betty and others who are very ill, that you would be with them in a very special way. We think, too, of those who are discouraged, those who are down today. Be with them. Lord, wrap your arms of love about them. May they be lifted up to a higher spiritual level. And as we come to your house here and and for this service, we just pray that you will anoint the speaker. And as he presents the message, may our hearts be drawn out to you even more. And Lord, we pray for, for the different um, requests that people have made with cards and other things. You know each, each situation better than the rest of us. You know how to answer every everyone and we pray that you would guide our church may your holy spirit take full control and may we have may we have a beacon on the hill lord that those in the community that are lurking for the light they will see it and be drawn to the to your message in your church and may there be a vast multitude here ready for your soon coming in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Well, my name is Chad Cruiser. For those of you who do not know me, my wife is Fadia. And we have a ministry called Anchor Point Films where we have gone around to archaeologists, historians, theologians, scholars, medical professionals, and made documentaries on a range of subjects from health to the Bible and archaeology, history, and prophecy. We also have a YouTube channel called Health and Homestead. Health and Homestead, so you can check that out. And I'm excited to dive into our message this morning, but before we do, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study. Lord, I pray that you would take our minds away from all the things of the week and that you would rivet them to your word. Lord, bless us with your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts individually in a way that you only can. We give the time to you. May Jesus be uplifted, for in his name we pray. Amen. True story of a young man by the name of Siegfried. He feared the day would come. He knew the day would come. And finally the letter came, and the letter was sitting in his hand. He knew what was inside, but as he peeled it open, opened it up, and he read the contents, he knew that he had been summoned to the military. He had been drafted into the German army. And being a young Seventh-day Adventist, he knew that this was not a good situation for him. He knew that there, to be able to follow God's commandments, there would be, well, it didn't seem like there would be any way to do it. He knew that his, his diet and his desire not to fight for the Germans and so forth, not to carry a gun, all these things seemed like they would be a very serious problem, but yet the time came. His dad could have used him on the farm, but he had to go. When the German army called, you went, and so he went, and he spent the first morning running 10 miles before breakfast as everyone else did. And then breakfast came, and he was famished. He was just desperately hungry, but what the trouble was is much of the food he couldn't eat. And so basically he had some bread and just some very simple food. And, and so this was day after day. He's working very hard, not getting enough calories. And, and then finally he had to go and learn to shoot, but he didn't want to carry a gun. And so he said to, his, to the uh, superior above him as he hand, was handed a gun, he said, well, actually, I'm, I, I'm not going to use a gun. And the man said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't want to kill anybody. And, and the man said, what did you say? And then the man pulled out his gun and just began to beat Siegfried. I mean, it was, he pulled out a pistol, but he began to just kick and punch and stomp. When Siegfried hit the floor, the man began to just kick him in the ribs, broke a rib, and, and just clubbed him over the head with the butt of his pistol, cutting open his head. His blood is coming forth from Siegfried's head. And he just kept beating and beating and beating until the military police came and began to pull the, this young man who was getting beaten away. But even as they were dragging him away, the captain still began to beat him. And finally, they threw him into what they called the hole. While he was in the hole, the hole there was about a six-foot long room by about four feet wide. And the tall, it was not tall enough to stand up in. And so for days he's in the hole, it's damp, wet, and very cold, and he's getting very little food. He's shivering, he's suffering. But after three days, finally they let him out, and it was, it was the afternoon on Friday. But the trouble was, he knew what was coming next. He knew that, okay, the rest of the day he had off, but then he knew the next morning, Saturday morning, they would be off doing their 10-mile run and back to work again. And yet he knew what God said about his holy Sabbath day. And Siegfried, that next morning, woke up actually before everybody else did, early, early in the morning, and he's praying, Lord, I just pray that you'd be with me. Give me the strength to stand up for my convictions, for what I know to be true. And finally the time came where the you know, captain came in again, and he said, everybody up, and, and everybody was getting ready. They're throwing on their clothing, and he put on his clothing, but as they were getting ready to go to a run, he said, uh, sir, I, I can't run today. And he said, oh, are you sick? Something's wrong? And he said, well, no, uh, <clears throat> you know, the God of heaven, the creator in the, of the heavens and earth, 
He created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested, and he commanded the rest of us to do the same, and so I can't go for a run. And the man looked at him in silence. He said, what is this foolishness you are talking about? And he said, sorry, sir, I, I keep the Sabbath holy, and I, I, I can't work today. And this time, the man did not beat him. He said, we have a place for you, actually. What we do is we bring you, and we can have you put before the firing line. And, okay, we have a place, we'll let you go. And so they actually came, and they stuck him in the hole again. There he is back in the hole, and he's praying. And while he's praying, he hears someone across the hallway and he, they, somehow that person said, hey, what are you in for? And, and he said, well, I'm in here because I, I keep the Sabbath. He asked the other guy, what are you in for? He said, well, I got in a fight with somebody. And, and the guy is just kind of laughing. And for him, it was all fun. And he said, oh, there was another guy who was in here for the Sabbath before. And the young man who kept the Sabbath, Siegfried, so it was, well, how long was he in for? The guy said, I don't know, I think maybe eight years or something. I'm not sure. And so he's thinking, wow, am I, do I have years and years to be in here? Or am I going to go before the firing squad? Well, later that afternoon, Siegfried was dragged out of his cell, and he was wondering, am I going to be killed right now? Or will they execute me right at this moment? And so and they, they took him past where he figured they would have shot him, and they brought him instead to the headquarters. And in the headquarters, he was brought before the judge, along with about five other men that were there on the panel with him, and then there were maybe a dozen or more other men there to just watch, watch the proceedings of this trial. And as he sat down, he could see the look in their eyes. These did not look like friendly eyes. And finally, they said, what is your number? And he spouted off his number, you know, whatever, 0161413. And uh, your name, and he told them his name. And they said, you have been found in dereliction of duty. You've, you've chosen to not comply with the orders of an officer. Is this true? And he said, yes. But they said, well, what do you have to say for yourself? And he began to tell them. He said, I'm, I am a follower of God. And the creator God has made the world in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested and this is the seventh day, and he has commanded us not to work on this day. And the man said, what are you talking about? This is Saturday. And he said, well, the Bible actually teaches that Saturday is the seventh day. And this is the day we are to rest. And the, the, the um, judge said, are you telling me this is in the Bible? And he said, yes, it is. And he said to one of the men there, he said, can you... Do we have a Bible here on, on, on the ground somewhere? And the man said, I'll, I'll go find a Bible. And so as he went off, the judge actually said to Siegfried, he said, well, tell us from the Bible while he's gone. Just if you remember some verses, tell us from the Bible about this Sabbath that you're talking about. And so he said, well, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, imperfection, chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the Sabbath, Sabbath, seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So the Bible says right in the beginning, six days, God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and he sanctified, he made that day holy. Then Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 8, says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, Sabbath day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, God commanded after he kept it, he commanded us to remember the day that he had rested, and that's why it's the Lord's day, because it was the day the Lord rested. And then when Jesus, our Savior, came to this earth, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And you see, Jesus, even when he was here, he too kept the Sabbath day holy. And you may wonder, but what is, how do we know which is the first and which is the seventh? Well, in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 52, he said, this man... 
speaking of Joseph of Arimathea, this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on, the text says. And so many Christians celebrate this day that Jesus died on as good, what? Friday. Jesus died on what the many people call, I should say, Good Friday. And it says the Sabbath was drawing on. The Sabbath was almost there. Meaning the, the sixth day of the week that we call Friday is just before the Sabbath, which is Saturday. And as the judge heard this, and he, he shared a few more verses right from his memory, he said, uh, he they actually brought, and he said, is there, is there a pastor on, on, you know, in the barracks here somewhere? And they brought in a Lutheran pastor. And the, the Lutheran pastor, actually, what happened first, they said, well, but what about Sunday? Do, isn't there something that teaches in the Bible that Sunday is the day to keep? And this young man said, I can give you dozens of verses showing that the Sabbath is the day that God gave to us and not Sunday. But he said to the man, he said, if you can find one verse, young Siegfried said, if you can find one verse in the Bible that says Sunday is the day to be kept, I will keep that day. Then they, as they called in the, the Lutheran pastor, the judge asked the Lutheran pastor, he said, hey, this young man is saying that the seventh day is the Sabbath, that Saturday, from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, that that is actually the Sabbath. What do you have to say about that? And the Lutheran pastor said, well, if he's a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, they got a lot of evidence to back up that, and that's actually true what he's saying. And after he said that, the, he asked him, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And the young man said, yes, I am. The judge then went on to say to young Siegfried, he said, listen, he said, we had decided before you had come in that we were going to execute you. We were going to bring you before the firing squad. He said, now, but I can see that you thoroughly believe in what you believe, and I can also see that you have a lot of evidence to back up what you believe. And we recognize we actually could use more young men like you in the German army but we see that your conviction makes it so that you would not be a good soldier in our army. And so we're actually going to write papers to allow you to go home. And then they came to him. They flooded him afterward and they said, can you show us those? Can you, do you have something with those Bible verses written down so that we can look those up? And he said, well, yeah, I have some tracks in, my, in, in the barracks. And so he began to pass out the tracks to these superiors and to the judge and to all of these high-ranking officials. They began to take them. He ran out of them. And then he started writing down on paper the text so that they could know the truth of the word of God. But you know what? The Sabbath is a funny thing. It looks weird, doesn't it? Everybody keeps Sunday. And then we keep the Sabbath holy. It's not popular. It, it looks strange. It looks foolish, right? And you may know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God says he has chosen the foolish things of the world. Isn't it interesting that so much of what God asks us to do just seems kind of foolish and embarrassing? Is that true, yes or no? Think about it. And then he goes on to say in the next verse, verse 28, and the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The Bible says that the things God chooses look like foolishness. And it's so true all throughout the Bible. All the true teachings of Scripture. Look at, look at the idea of creation. Listen, in, in, in the ideas of society, this is foolishness. The idea of creation. Come on, evolution must be true. This must be the case. This is so foolish. But actually, we have good evidence for what we believe. Sabbath. 
Very strange. But we have incredible evidence for what we believe. You come down to various things from the scriptures. The Bible even says, if you have your Bibles, look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that's what we were just quoting from. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, we're going to begin in verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now, we, we think of the cross, and, and that may warm our heart. That may give us, you know, a warm fuzzy because we think, oh, the cross where my Savior died. But it would be kind of like if somebody started a religion in the United States, and they were so excited that their leader went to the electric chair. And they're like, the electric chair, isn't that great? And you'd be like, no, that's ridiculous. That's shameful. The leader of your church died like this, this ignominious death. This is terrible. This is not nice. This is foolishness, right? It was a stumbling block to the Jews. It was foolishness to the Greeks. This didn't make any sense. Who would want to be a part of a religion like that? And so this is what Paul says. The things of, of the gospel are looked down upon. They're mocked. And then it goes on to say in verse 24, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, meaning these are people who once thought it was foolishness, but it says but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the thing that looks weak is actually powerful, and the thing that looks foolish is actually wise. And this is what God says, that if we follow him, we have to be willing to look foolish for him. Is that true, yes or no? Yes. Out of the mouth of babes, right? This is, this is the truth, that to follow Christ, we have to look foolish. But none of us really like that. Yes or no? That's what the Sabbath school is about this morning. Jonah, Jonah says, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, listen, if you're a prophet, one of the things you like being about prophet is your prophecies coming true, right? And then God's like, go over there, my, my prophet, and tell them something that uh, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And then guess what happened? It didn't happen. But God doesn't mind so much if you look like a fool for a time. And here's the thing. Think about Jesus. Did Jesus ever look like a fool to the multitude, yes or no? Over and over and over. Jesus said things repeatedly that people misunderstood. He said, John chapter 6, you need to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And the Jews are like, what? This guy's telling us to, to, to do cannibalism? And the majority of his disciples at that point turned away never to follow him again. He said things that were misunderstood. And over and over and over, he was mocked for what he said. He was castigated. He was put down for the things that he spoke about. And if they would do this to Jesus, do we not expect they will do it to us, yes or no? We can expect that. And so these things are foolishness to the world. But the same person who thinks it's foolish, when they give their life to Jesus, they realize that foolish thing was not foolish, but it was the wisdom of God. And God is actually calling for us to be willing, to be willing to look foolish for him. But often we're embarrassed. And the Bible says, as you may remember in Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. There's actually power in faith in Jesus Christ. Though it looks like weakness, it looks like ignorance in the world's view, there's actually power in it. And Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has changed my life, Paul said. And so we should have no, no shame because of this. This young man had stored up God's word in his mind and in his heart, Siegfried that we just mentioned. What would have happened if he got before the judge there and he couldn't give an evidence as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man to ask if you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, or new translations say gentleness and respect. 
What would have happened if he would have come before the judge and he would have said, well, Saturday, uh, that's the day I keep holy. Well, well, why do you believe that? And he couldn't back it up. He likely would have been put before the firing squad, yes or no. He likely would have lost his life. But he spoke with authority because when you speak from the word of God, you know that it's true. You can doubt everything about yourself. You can doubt your own sincerity, but you know you know that the word of God is the word of God. And as he spoke the word of God, I know the Holy Spirit filled the hearts of those men in that room, and they were convicted. They, it was like they had been in the presence of Jesus. Now, we are not Jesus, you get my point. But the Holy Spirit just touched them, and, and there was the power of God because Jesus is the word of God. So their hearts were touched, and they were impacted by this. His life was saved because he had stored up the word of God in his minds and in his heart. And his parents had had the wisdom to not give him an iPhone. Well, they didn't have the iPhone back then, mind you, obviously. This was years ago. But they didn't fill his life with garbage and make that his babysitter. What they did was they actually got him into the word of God. They made him a thinking individual, a reasoning person, one who could stand up for what he knew to be true. And when his life was called on the line, and even if he would have been called to lose his life right there, that would have been okay because his heart would have been right with God. That would have been okay. But how much more powerful that he could be a testimony that these men could make a decision, they at least make a decision to save his life. And hopefully, hopefully in heaven, we'll find out that some of those superiors actually will be in the kingdom because of his witness. But some of you have heard the story of Richard Wormbrand from Romania, who was tortured for his faith. His wife later on wrote a book called The Pastor's Wife, because she too, her husband had been thrown in and gone through torture in prison, and she knew that she might go to prison and, and suffer too. And listen to what she said in her book. She said, after spending months in the labor camps, those of us who had faith realized for the first time how rich we were. The youngest Christians and the weakest had more resources to call on than the wealthiest old ladies and the most brilliant intellectuals. It was so sad to watch, but the upper class women were often the most pitiful in the prison labor camps. Life was harder for them than for anyone. They lost the most in the material sense, and they had the fewest inner resources to fill the gap. A rubble of old games, a bridge, hats, fancy clothes, hotels, luxurious dining, cinema, lost weekends and lovers rattled about in their heads like junk in the back seat of a car. Their nerves gave way first, as did their soft white hands. After long hours of grueling work, many of the women came to us religious prisoners and asked, begged even, to be told something of what we remembered from the Bible. The words we shared from God's word gave hope, comfort, and life. Of course, we had no Bible. We ourselves hungered for it more than bread. How I wished I had learned more of the Bible by heart while still in freedom. But the passages we did know, we repeated daily and at night when we held vigils for prayer. Other Christians like me had deliberately committed long passages uh, uh, to memory, knowing that soon their turn would come for a rest. They knew what might come in the future, so they prepared by storing up the scriptures. So they brought precious riches to prison with them that could not be stolen. While others quarreled and fought, we lay on our mattresses and used the Bible for prayer and meditation and repeated its verses to ourselves through the long, dark nights. We learned what verses newcomers brought and taught them what we knew. In this way, an unwritten Bible circulated through all of Romania's prisons. Isn't that powerful? That this woman recognized that she, the future maybe, she didn't know for sure, she knew that she might have to be cast into prison for her faith. And think about this. If you lived in a, in a, in a communist country, sure, obviously you had, you had the Orthodox, you have some Christians and so forth, but many of the people in the, in the party, the communist party, I mean, most of them would be atheists. And so they're, they're going to make you look like a fool for believing what you believe. Obviously, communism is the answer, right? That's going to bring about a utopia, right? 
And that's what we've seen every time communism's taken over a nation. It's gone real well, right? Well, no, just the opposite. It brings about poverty and wretchedness. But nevertheless, that's beside the point. The point is, you would look like a fool as skeptics were all around you. And yet, people like Sabrina were willing to stand for the truth. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, then God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. He says even the things that are despised, this is what God has chosen to reveal who he is. It's interesting because God could have come. Jesus did not have to come as like a suffering servant. I mean, he did for our salvation, but he could have come like a tough guy. A tough guy that everybody would follow. He could have been the guy that nobody could fight, nobody could take over. He could have, he could have helped the Jews conquer the world, but he didn't. Isn't that weird? Like he had the power to do it and he didn't do it. I mean, talk about powerful when you have the power to do something and you don't use that power. That's actually unbelievably powerful. But instead of actually being the conqueror, he looks like the one who is conquered. And who wants a God like that? I heard heard a very popular, actually the most popular podcaster just say, he said, isn't it interesting that all religions of the world are respected, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, people seldom speak down about these religions. And this guy's an atheist. He said, but the one religion everybody looks down on is Christianity. Isn't that interesting? Actually, it's not surprising Because the devil doesn't fight himself. What he fights is the thing that looks weak, but that is the most powerful thing on the planet, in the universe. That's what he fights. Because there is a power there. And it's funny, he comes across as he's strong, but he's a defeated foe. He is the one who has no power. Now, he does have power when we are not in Jesus Christ. He's actually very powerful if we're not in Christ. But when we're in Jesus, there is power in him. And this woman was willing, Sabina, was willing to look like a fool for Jesus. This young man, Siegfried, was willing to look like a fool for Jesus. And both of them found power in the word of God. We are told this in Last Day Events, page 67, the time will come. When many will be deprived of the written word. But if this word is printed in the memory, no one can take it from us. There is only one place on planet earth that you cannot have the Bible stolen from you. And that is when you have it hidden right here. Because think about this. You think, well, I got, I got a Bible on my phone. I don't need to. I, I, I can look it up anything I want at any time on my phone. I could Google it. It tells me whatever I want. Who needs to memorize It's useless today. We don't need that. Is that true, yes or no? And you may be able to look it up. But soon the time is coming where many of us are going to be deprived of the written word or will be deprived of our Bibles or our cell phones or what have you. And the only place that it can't be stolen from us is if we store it up in our minds and in our hearts. We are also told in 10 manuscript releases, page 298, study the word of God. Commit its precious promises to memory so that when we shall be deprived of our Bibles, we shall still be in possession of the Word of God. We need to be spending time. You say, Chad, I'm so busy. I don't have time for this. But I seldom meet a human being that has no time for either television or internet or social media or Snapchat or Instagram or, you know, Fox News or CNN or whatever whatever news source you like, whatever it is, people find time for the things they like in this world. If they like sports, they find time for the sports. If they're young people and they're on TikTok or Instagram or Snapchat, they don't say, oh boy, I I just can never find time to do it. Because when you have a two-second break, they whip it out, they look at it, boom, and if they have to go back to something else, they put it away. What if the devil has us so caught up in the world That we've fallen asleep. That we've fallen asleep. The Bible says the church would become Laodicea, and I'm not pointing the fingers at anybody. It says we all felt fall asleep. Every single one of us. And God wants to wake us up before he comes back in the clouds of heaven. And and we're not being persecuted now because there's no reason to persecute us. Because as we acquiesce to the ways of society, and I'm not here putting the finger, you know, pointing the finger at anybody. 
We as a people, we've fallen asleep. Lord, help us. Help us come back to Jesus. Help us to yield our hearts to him. Sabina stored up God's word in her mind and heart. Friedrich, or Siegfried did the same thing. And Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, as you well know, the tempter came to him. It says there in Matthew chapter 4, then was, beginning in verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, what are the next three words? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, Jesus here is at the point of nearly death. He's dying of hunger at this point, and I could go into the physiology of what was taking place there. But here he is just about to die, and the devil comes to him at his absolute weakest point. He's in physi- physiological pain. His body is breaking down from lack of nutrition. It's physically painful to go through this. And at this time, he is starving to death, and then the tempter comes to him with a temptation on food. And Jesus overcomes the tempter. The Son of God overcomes the tempter by quoting the Bible, quoting specifically, actually, the book of Deuteronomy. And the powerful thing is, he quotes it in context. The context is exactly what he was going through. It was the Israelites and their wilderness wanderings and their hunger, and God tested them to know what was in thine heart, to see if that would keep his commandments or no. And he suffered thee and humbled thee to know what was in thine heart, So what does it say? It says the same thing. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. This is what Deuteronomy says. He quotes it in the context that this is what he's struggling with. I'm hunger, I'm suffering, I'm hungry, I'm suffering, I'm in the desert, I'm in the wilderness. And instead of trusting to self, he trusts to God. And God gives him the victory. Three times in the wilderness, Jesus quotes the word of God to overcome. Many people don't know that while Jesus was on the cross, there are what what are called the seven statements of Christ. The scholars call them the seven statements of Christ on the cross. And out of those seven statements, three of them are quotations of the word of God. Three times Jesus is quoting, at the greatest suffering, the greatest trial, the greatest tribulation humanity of any humans ever had to go through was what Jesus was going through on the cross. And three times he is clinging to the word of God while he's on the cross. If Jesus needed the power of the word of God while he was dying for us, do you think we need the word of God in our hearts to strengthen us in our temptations, in our trials? The answer is yes. True story of a friend of mine who was doing mission work in Colombia. His name's Omar, Omar Mosquera. And he was, he was sharing the gospel as a missionary and sharing with people there, and as you may know the history of Colombia, there's been a lot of drug trafficking and so forth down there, and there were guerrilla soldiers that actually came and captured him, and they said, hey, what are you doing? And he said, I'm a missionary, I'm sharing the gospel in the area, and they said, no, you're not, you are a spy. And he said, no, I'm I'm, I'm not a spy, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm a missionary, we're sharing Jesus Christ with the people of the area. They said, no, you're not, We, we believe you are spies, come with us. They took him, they incarcerated him, they finally brought before the the head of the guerrilla soldiers. And this man, as he looked at him, he said, what are you doing here? My friend Omar and his friend, he said, what are you doing here? And he said, we are Seventh-day Adventists, we are missionaries in the area, we're sharing the gospel. And the man said, no, you're not. You are spies. You're out here trying to see what we're doing out here. He said, sir, I assure you, we are Seventh-day Adventists, we are doing nothing of the sort, we are simply sharing about the love of Jesus with people in this area. And the man said this. This is a true story. He said to him, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you will explain to me the 2300-day prophecy or I will kill you. True story. What would you do? What would you do? He said, I'll give you five minutes to prepare. And he didn't have a phone. It wasn't like, oh, I can Google it quick and check out. Hey, what is it? Hey, what is that? You know? I mean, what he did was he went and said a, he went and said a prayer to his heavenly father. He came back and he opened his Bible to Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, 
He began to give him the beginning dates of 457 B.C. He showed him in Daniel chapter 9 that we find that beginning date, that that brings us to the coming of the Messiah, that comes to the crucifixion of the of this Messiah. Then finally the gospel goes to the Gentiles, and then where that led to in the end. And he shares this with man. He goes through the whole prophecy. He explains it to the man. And when he finishes sharing with him this Bible study on Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, the man said to him, now I know your seventh day Adventists. He said, now I know your seventh day Adventists. While you're in the area, I'm going to send my soldiers out to the people of the area and tell them to come to your meetings. <laughs> True story. Now, we don't believe in forcing people <laughs> into the gospel. That's not our belief. We believe God is a God of choice. Amen? But he, he was the guerrilla leader. He could do whatever he wanted to, right? And so that's what happened. But what would happen with your children? Have you been preparing your children for what is soon to come upon planet Earth? Are you preparing your children for what the Bible tells us is going to happen? We're not wondering what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. And we need to be ready. We need to be ready to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Meaning, God needs to be holy in our hearts. And we should be ready to always give an answer to everyone that asks us a reason of the hope that is in us with gentleness and respect. Or as the King James says, meekness and fear. We need to know how to share the faith of Jesus, but the trouble is many times we're fearful. We're, we're, we're afraid, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. This morning in Sabbath school, the uh, pastor was saying, well, maybe, maybe sometimes we're afraid to go forward because, well, somebody could do a better job. Well, it's true. I know if Mark Finley were here, he would do a much better job than me, and so would, so would Doug Batchelor, and sh so would David Asher, or whoever, right? But you know what? God uses each one of us no matter where we are. We can only do the best we can do. And you can only share the little bit about what you know. And what I know now, I didn't know 22 years ago. Meaning in the beginning, I could only share one or two things, very little. But I shared the couple things I knew. And then I had to find more. And then people would challenge me and say, hey, you're wrong about this. And then I'd have to go home and study and say, are we wrong? Maybe we are wrong. Maybe we are. And then I'd go home and study and I'd go, no, no, look what the Bible says. Oh, this is so clear. And so then I actually had to wrestle with this because I wasn't raised in this faith. I kept Sunday every, every week. That's what I was grown to do. That's what I was raised to do. And so here I was in this situation. And if it's not true, I'm not going to waste my time with this. Who wants to look foolish for something that is foolish? But this is not foolishness. It is the truth of the word of God. It may look like foolishness. I'm okay believing in something that looks foolish if it is actually true. But I want to know that it's true. And you can't just trust the pastor that it's true. You can't just trust me that it's true. Don't take my word for it. You have to know if it is the truth. And if it's not, I'll say the same thing. You can show me a text that there's one text in the Bible that says, you need to keep Sunday holy. I'll do it. I'll do it I'll, tomorrow. I'm not going to wait a week. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. But I know, I've done this for 20-some years. I've asked people, I've offered thousands of dollars for years, and nobody's ever been able to find a text. And I've read the Bible through. It's just not in there. It's not there. But we need to know the Bible for our, our own selves, not, not somebody else. And when we know the truth, it will begin to, we'll still have some fear and trepidation in our heart. But we can go forward with power knowing that it is the Word of God. Because the Bible is prophesied in, in Revelation 21, verse 8. It says, but the fearful... And the word there, fearful, doesn't mean that you simply have fear. It means you're cowardly because we all have fear. Even Jesus prayed to the Father, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. There was a fear in Jesus' heart, but he said, nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. Jesus was not a coward. You can have a fear in your heart, but not end up being a coward. Does that make sense? Soldiers who go to war, even, even Navy SEALs, the most elite soldiers or Army Rangers or these various soldiers, even when they're in war, they've practiced and they've trained and they've studied and they've, they've gone through all the rigorous training that they need. And I can tell you, when they're in a, in a bloody fight, their heart is racing. They're not calm like they're sitting on the couch. There is a fear in their heart, yet they go forward anyway. So they're not cowards. There may be fear, but they're not cowards, you understand. We may have a fear in our heart to share our faith with someone else. Maybe it's because we're afraid we'll make a mistake. I'll tell you, the first evangelistic series I preached was six months after I came into this church. I got up and I was telling people about, you know, David in the lion's den. Just in case you don't know, David was never in a lion's den. It was who? 
It was Daniel. You say, what? You got up and made mistakes? Yeah, I make mistakes. I still do. So should I stop until I stop making mistakes? No. We do the best with what we can. And my wife can come tell me all the mistakes I make. <laughs> she does that for me. She does. She's like, and sometimes she yells it out, and I'm like half deaf. And I, huh, what? I can't hear you. And so, but nevertheless, and I need to be told that, because we all make mistakes, and that's okay. Obviously, the more we, you know, learn, the less we'll make the mistakes, sure, right? But we keep going forward. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, or the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That doesn't mean that you have fear. I have fear to do God's work. But we have to go forward and do it anyway. And, or else we'll be cowards. And I, I'm not saying that simply to put people down. That's what it says. And God is saying, you may have fear, but go forward anyway. That young man, Siegfried, when I told you the story, I didn't tell you about all the emotions. In the book, he tells you the emotions that he was going through. He was suffering. He was struggling. But when he actually stood up, because he was struggling until he said the truth, when he spoke the truth, even though he got the tar beat out of him, he had a peace in his heart. The fear was more before he actually stood up for the truth. Once he stood up for it, there was this courage and this peace that came over him. But I'll admit, then they throw them in the, in, in the hole, and then the fear comes back. Are they going to kill me? Am I going to be in here for years? Am I, I going to go through this? You can imagine all these things that run through the mind. There is a fear again. But then when he was brought before them, once again, he was not a coward. He stood up for the truth anyway. And I want to close with a story today, another true story. Some of you, how many of you have heard of Corey Ten Boom? Have you heard that name before? A number of us, quite a few of us. She was a Dutch woman. True story, and this is not the story that you probably know, unless you've heard me talk about it, likely you haven't heard this one. She actually wrote multiple books, not just The Hiding Place, which if you haven't read The Hiding Place, it's one of the best written books that I've ever read on an on a autobiography. Incredible story, very, very well written. Read the book The Hiding Place. But nevertheless, this is not about The Hiding Place. This is about after, so she was a woman who basically, I'll tell you a little background on her. She was a woman, Dutch woman, who lived during World War II, and her family had the books called The Hiding Place because her family had a, a fake wall installed in their house so they could hide behind that wall Jewish people from the Nazis. And so, but even during that time, well, we'll get back to that. So that's not what this story is about. This story is about after the war, her, well, during the war, her, she was thrown in a concentration camp. Her father was, her sister was, and her sister and her father died in the concentration camp. And Corey lived through it, and after the war, she chose to become a missionary, to go share the gospel with people. And she heard that this particular African country had just had a, like a coup or a government turnover, and so she heard that the next day after the government had been changed, the government called in a, group, a, a large group of Christians to the government office, and when they arrived, they killed them all. The next day, they called another group of Christians to the government office, and they too were killed. The third day, same thing, and somewhere around the third or fourth day, uh, Cor Corey had heard this within the first couple days, and so she decided, I'm going to go there and share the gospel with these people. So she makes her way to this particular country in Africa, and she... It's worked out that she can go preach the gospel to these people. She's, she's allowed to go into a building. And, and this, this is not like a fancy building like this. Instead, it's one of those, if you've ever been on a mission trip to, to maybe backwoods or the outback of, you know, wherever. Basically, it was like a, a structure with no windows, no screens, and the naked light bulb with the bugs flying around it and so forth. And she's preaching to them about the, the love of Jesus and how Jesus loves them. And they can accept Jesus. They can be saved even if they go through the trials. But she noticed as she was preaching that nobody was listening. And you can tell when you're a preacher generally if nobody's listening, it happens. And she noticed nobody's paying attention. They were instead looking back and forth. And she could tell that there was fear in their eyes. They were thinking, is he the next one to die? Is she the next one to lose her life? Will I be the next one executed? And so right there, she just stopped her sermon, and she, just, she decided, I'm not preaching this, and she began to change. She said, I want to tell you my experience of when the Nazis took over my country of Holland. 
You see, they were coming in, and my family, we were hiding Jews in our house, and I recognized if we were caught, we would be executed. And she said, a terror gripped me, and I was terrified and recognized, I thought, I don't have enough faith to be a martyr for Jesus. And it troubled her so much that she went to her father, and she said, Dad, I'm struggling because I'm afraid I don't have enough, enough faith to be a martyr for Jesus. And her wise Dutch father responded to her. He said, Corey, when we take a trip into Amsterdam, when we are getting on the train, he said, how far before we get on the train do I give you the money? Do I give you the money three days before? She said, no. Two days, one day, how, how far before do I give you the money? She said, Dad, you give me the money right before we get on the train. And she said, the father said, Corey, it's the same thing with God. It's the same thing with God. That if he's not calling you to be a martyr today, he doesn't need to give you a martyr's faith today. But if God brings you to the point, and you're da daily walking with him, daily following him, seeking him, spending time with him daily in his word, if he someday calls you to be a martyr, he will give you that day a martyr's faith. And she's sharing this story with these people who are living in a very similar situation. And what happened was, about two weeks later, half of that congregation was ex executed. And within another month, the other half lost their life. But Corey wrote this after that experience. She said, but I must tell you something. I was so happy that the Lord used me to encourage these people. For unlike many of their leaders, I had the word of God. I had been to the Bible and discovered that Jesus said he had not only overcome the world, but to all those who remain faithful to the end, he would give a crown of life. She says these words. How can we get ready for the persecution? We need to feed on the word of God. Digest it. Make it a part of our being. This will mean disciplined Bible study each day as we not only memorize long passages of Scripture, but put the principles to work in our lives. This is a woman who had been through torture. This is a woman who had gone through her own time of trouble, as it were. And she tells us, look, if we want to get ready for what's to come upon the planet Earth, she didn't believe in, well, I won't go into that yet. She didn't believe it was going to be easy in the future. She knew trials and tribulations were going to come. But what did she say? She said, to prepare for this, we need to feed on the Word of God daily. We need to spend time daily in the Word of God, and we also need to store up God's Word in our minds and in our hearts so that we can find strength in the trials that are going to come upon planet Earth. And by the way, we don't just need it for some future terror. We need it for today to give strength encouragement to our own souls and so that we have a word in season so we can be a light to people around us and then when she finished sharing her story the people were so excited they started turning back and forth once again but this time instead of with fear and trepidation in their eyes now they're smiling at each other and they broke out in a song you may know it in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And Corey was so happy that she could bring joy and happiness to these people. And friends, I want to challenge you. Are you raising up your children to know the Word of God? Kids can suck up the Word of God and memorize it like a sponge. We get older, old people like me, obviously, right? And it gets a little harder. But the fact is, we can still memorize, but with our children, we should be raising them. They should know why they believe what we believe. We, can, we should be able to ask them, hey, why do you believe this? And boom, 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 boom. They can just tell you. They should be able to stand for their faith because they're going to have to go into these tribulations. Babylon will take over again, the Bible says. And the, first day, the first Babylon took the children away from the parents. Could that happen again? What if it did? Would, we be, would our children be able to stand? We need to make them ready 
We need to raise our children up in the, in the way and the admonition of the Lord. And not only the children, but friends, we need to spend time every single day in God's word. I'm going to make two simple appeals today. Number one, we need to be spending time daily in God's word. How many of you say, even if you already do this, you can still raise your hand. I, I, I every day spend time with Jesus and his word. But how many of you want to say, Jesus, I want by your help, by your strength, to spend time daily in your word. How many of you want to raise your hand and, hand and say, I want to do that? Amen. You can put your hands down. The second thing. This is, this is a challenge that may be very difficult, but it would be a blessing. I want to challenge you to at least attempt. And sometimes it's better to attempt something and fail than to never attempt and never gain anything, right? But I want to challenge you to try over the course of the next two months that each week over the course of the next two months you will try to memorize two new verses from the Word of God. So that would be eight weeks times two would be 16 verses. Two months from now you would know 16 verses that you don't know today, that you don't have memorized. And I would challenge you, this, I have found one of the sweetest experiences in my spiritual life is storing up God's word in my mind and in my heart. Because there is the only place no one can take it from us. Is there anyone who would like to say, you know what, I want to try to attempt to, over the next couple months, store up two verses per week over the next couple months? You can put your hands down. Let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faithful testimonies of brothers and sisters who have stood strong in trial. Whether it's my friend Omar, whether it's Siegfried, whether it's our Savior Jesus, the only perfect example. Lord, we can't do this of our own strength. We may be fearful thinking of what's coming in the future, but Lord, help us not be cowards. We can be fearful, but that we cling to you in the times of fear. We, we run to your promises that Jesus can give us strength. That we as, even if simplest verse, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I may not be able to do it alone, but I can do all things through Christ. And thank you that he strengthens us. Lord, I pray that you would go with each one of us, that you would help us to store up your word, that you would help us to spend time in your word every day, and with our children even, in your word. That we would help them to know your word so well that they would, they would know why they believe what they believe so that they wouldn't be walking out in droves, Lord. But Lord, we know there's even temptations all around like never before with the internet. Help us, Lord, not to be consumed with the world, but put our Savior Jesus first, we pray. For in his name we pray, amen. Just to let you know very quickly, tonight is going to be the most amazing prophecy that will be tonight. We skip tomorrow night, no message. Monday is going to be the Antichrist. I run into young people in the church who don't know who the Antichrist is. They go their whole life, never figure out what we believe. I want to challenge you. Praise the Lord, we have a children's program over there, and we have something for everyone else over here. And then we will be back. Uh, Tuesday night is going to be the Antichrist power revealed. Then we'll be back. Uh, Wednesday will be signs of the end. Then we'll look at the millennium on Thursday night. Then we'll look at the Antichrist, uh, or sorry, an ancient prophecy and its fulfillment. Revelations Lady in Red will be next Saturday, but tonight is going to be the most amazing prophecy. Pastor. Let's stand. Let's stand for the closing hymn, 334. Come thou found.
blessed today? The blessings continue each night. God has given us a gift these next few weeks. We have meetings every night. Come learn more of the Word of God so it can be stored safely in your heart. Amen? Now, two quick announcements. One, our prayer group, we're not going to have it today, but remember, pray our church, the city, and our children. Amen? We want to invite everybody to the fellowship hall. We're going to have a fellowship lunch and have a good time just praising and worshiping our God together. He is so good to us. Amen? Amen. You may be dismissed.